we pray that you've had a good day. Amen? Amen. And that the blessings of the Lord have smiled upon you. Amen. We have come to the middle of the last week. We've come to the middle of the last week. Uh, we are on the home stretch, as it were. We have, in the context of the book, we have one more, I would say, huge hurdle to jump over. And, and then once we jump over this hurdle, everything else is smooth sailing. Yeah, one, once we jump over this hurdle, er everything else is smooth sailing. <coughs> there are uh, parts in the book that you can kind of run through, and they're pretty very much self-explanatory. There are parts of the book of Revelation that you kind of have to take your time through and um, they'll challenge your thought processes. Um, I praise God for both parts and I'm just letting you know to give you a heads up that, that um, we'll land easy. <laughs> we'll land easy, all right? So today's lesson is probably the last challenging thing that we'll have to deal with. Uh, most, most everything that comes after this is, is just pretty straightforward, all right? Today's lesson is probably the most challenging, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, uh, it, it is probably one of the most challenging things that we'll have to tackle because of some of the implications of some th and some of the uh, ideas I'm going to present to us today, okay? Yeah. All right. Now, before we move on, I just want to say to you that are at home, um, thank you. God bless you. Uh, we pray that you have enjoyed and continue to enjoy uh, this journey through Revelation. Um, and as we go through this lesson, uh, my prayer is for you the same as it is for everyone that's here, but that um, you being at home, it won't get lost in translation. Um, so that my prayer is um, for that teachable spirit that even wherever you are watching um, this broadcast right now, um, that you will sense the indwelling and the resting of the Holy Spirit upon your mind and upon your very heart so that you can hear the suggestions of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Um, let's go to work, everybody, all right? Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we thank you uh, for blessing us with so much. And we are so unworthy for so many things, but yet you still bless us anyway. God, you've given us this wonderful testimony here in the book of Revelation, uh, this awesome gift of a book that testifies of you, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask the same thing that we have asked on most nights at the beginning of our lesson together, that you will give us a teachable spirit. May the Holy Spirit rest upon our thoughts tonight so that those things that are being presented will find residency in our hearts. May it motivate us to change, to be more like you. Now, Lord, use me as a tack on a wall. Hang a picture of Christ glorified, edified, and crucified for all of our sins. May the words of this preacher's mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Father God, we need thee. We need thee. O oh God, we need thee in your blessed and holy name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. <clears throat> Let's go to work. The seven plagues have just been described. We've just come through the, the time, if you would, of the seven plagues, specifically in chapter 16 of Revelation. Now, when we get to chapter 17, one of the angels, one of the angels, involved in the outpouring of God's wrath in the form of the plagues takes time to specifically explain to John why God has seemingly judged them so harshly. Yeah, takes time because he recognizes that the appearance of this thing is that God has judged harshly. Now, my friends, that's why if you were with us in our last lesson, whether here in this room or at home, I said at the end, that was rough. The reason why I said it was rough is because when you look at the, uh, the plagues, when you look at what God allows to happen, when you look at 
what God actually commissions to happen. That's rough. Uh, So rough is it that one of the angels, one of the angels who pour out these plagues recognizes and is commissioned by God to explain things to John so that John will be all right in his head. My friends, one of the themes, and we've talked about this before, and we'll talk about this as we get closer to the end, that becomes very clear throughout this whole journey is that Jesus wants everyone to understand. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a blessing. Jesus wants everyone to understand. And we'll find out later that he'll spend even years letting folk who are redeemed understand. And so even as he is painting this picture to John, recognizing the complexity and the perplexity that may be in John's mind, the angel now comes and says, let me explain to you all that you have seen. Are you with me? So let's look at number one. Revelation 17 can be divided into two parts, everybody. Revelation 17 can be divided into how many parts? Two parts. The first six verses focus on the woman and her activities when united with the beast. The first six verses focus on the woman and her activities when united with the beast. Can I keep moving? The final 12 verses focuses on the activities of the beast in the past, the present, and the future. The final 12 verses focuses on the activities of the beast in the past, the present, and the future. Now, friends, it's only an understanding all that the beast and this woman have done throughout history, do we get a better understanding as to why God deals with them so severely? All right? So let's look at the woman first. Can we do that? Let's look at the woman first. What does the woman represent in Revelation chapter 17? Well, Revelation 17 verses 1 and 2, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on, what everybody? Many waters. Verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Brothers and sisters, we know that in the Bible, a woman represents what? The church. A woman represents the church. Therefore, calling her a harlot, she represents an unfaithful church. Calling her a harlot, she represents an unfaithful church. Can I keep moving? Revelation 17 verse 5 gives us even more insight. And on her what, everybody? forehead a name was what written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of what everybody the earth Uh, later this woman this unfaithful church is identified in revelation chapter 17 verse 5 as the mother of what everybody the mother of harlots. Now, you must catch this, implying that this church has been around for a long time and has produced similarly unfaithful offspring. Can't be a mother if you ain't got no children. (laughs) She's produced similarly unfaithful offspring because she is the mother of harlots. Now watch this. Please listen to me for a minute. This should not be confused with the offspring of the woman that we see in Revelation chapter 12. Don't be confused there. But what is definitely being pointed out is that in these dual roles, these two separate roles, you have a harlot over here, you have a woman over here, the pure woman over here produces an offspring which becomes the remnant church of God The harlot over here has produced offspring as well that continue on in their apostate, unfaithful state. 
friends. The woman of Revelation 12 represents the, the, the culmination of people who have been truth seekers for the entire era of, Earth, of Earth's history. Those who are called the overcomers. The ones who lived up to the light that they had and still yet searched for more. And finally, at the end of the 2300-day prophecy, we know that God busted open the book so that everything could be understood, and thus was born a remnant movement, the offspring of the woman. But now, when we get to Revelation 17, the Bible lets us know that there is a, an unfaithful woman, and she has produced what, everybody? Offspring. Unfaithful offspring. Folks wonder why, friends of mine, there are... are so many running around saying so many different things. Well, I need only look at Revelation 17 verse 5 and realize that she has produced unfaithful offspring. How does this woman uh, make the earth? Can I move to the next one? How does this woman make the earth drunk as is stated in verse 2? Wine in the Bible represents doctrine. We've already gone over this. And in this case, this unfaithful woman has a cup full of false doctrines that many of the world have believed. Now, friends, I won't ask you to think back to a time, but I'll say we know that when a person is drunk, when a person is drunk, normally they lose a certain level of control of themselves. Normally, when a person is drunk, they can't be reasoned with, nor can they be trusted to make good choices. They aren't excused for the choices they make while they're drunk, but being drunk or inebriated does impact their level of reasoning. They become more susceptible to making bad choices. They become more susceptible to all kinds of things. They are drunk. And it's no wonder then, as this woman has made the whole world drunk with her false teachings, the world is now susceptible to her suggestions that she might make and that she might take control of the entire world. How does she do it? Because they're drunk. Believing what she says, inebriated, not able to make proper decisions, but not, not held responsible for their decisions. Yeah, you're still responsible because you chose to take that cup. No one forced it on you. No one pushed it in your hand. You chose to. It does not excuse the nations uh, for drinking in the first place, but it does give us an idea as to the, as to the theme that the revelator is trying to push here. Heard a horrible story, horrible story. Uh, I won't say where, but in a place far, far from here, where someone who was in a position of trust, in a position of trust, uh, gave alcohol to minors, led them down a path and a, a road that led the minors to make some bad decisions. While the minors were held accountable, the one in a position of trust was held responsible. It's no wonder, Elder Doug, why once we get to the end of this thing, you know who's dealt with last? You know who's dealt with last? And what you'll find is, by the way, what you'll find is, by the way, when, when, God, deals with, when God deals with them, it almost deals with them in the order of accountability and responsibility. So watch this. See, why is this woman, why is this woman sitting on the beast? Well, the reason for the woman sitting on the beast is an indication that while she gains control over the secular and political powers of the world, she is also dependent upon them. While she gains control, she is ultimately also dependent upon them. Revelation 17, verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit to where, everybody? The wilderness. And I saw what, everybody? A woman sitting on what? Scarlet beach, which was full of names of having what? Seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns. So 
What does verse 4 uh, let us know about the economic position of this church? Verse 4, Revelation, before you fill it in, Revelation 17, verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and what, everybody? Scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her what? Fornication. What this lets us know is that this unfaithful church would be a wealthy church. This unfaithful church would be a wealthy church. Come on, we're just building up some things right now. So it sits on the beast because while it has wrestled control, it is dependent upon. It is adorned in this way to show that it has wealth and I would even say economic prosperity. Not only does it have wealth and economic prosperity, but it has made the world drunk off the wine of its false teachings. And this woman is an apostate church, all right? Let's go to the next one, E. Does verse 6 reveal another characteristic of this woman? It reveals that this will be and has been a persecuting power because she is now, the, this apostate church, this harlot, she is now drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. Revelation 17, verse 6, can I keep moving? I'll wait. <laughs> you see, I listen to you. <laughs> you can't say I don't listen to you. It reveals that this will, be a, this will be and has been a persecuting power because she is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. I got to move. Revelation 17, verse 6. I saw the woman, what everybody? Drunk, it says, with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, watch what John does. I marveled with great amazement. Now, remember what's supposed to happen here, everybody. Please stay with me. What's supposed to happen here is that John is supposed to get an explanation as to why God has judged them so severely and so harshly by dumping out these seven bowls in the form of seven plagues. John is sitting there, and he is waiting for the explanation. All that he sees in front of him amazes him. It amazes him. It ama now, please, hear, hear me out for a minute. It amazes him. It's the revelator who has been receiving all these visions from God at the point of just being seeing this description is amazed by it. Now, if you think I'm taking this too far, look what the angel of the Lord says to him. Like, hold on, brother. Don't be amazed. <laughs> he says to him, why are you looking here in wonder? Let me explain to you the real deal. Because at a face value, looking at that thing, even John marveled. John looks and he's amazed by what he sees. And my friends, my friends, my friends, if John can be amazed in the midst of a vision, uh, should we not then be careful as to what we dabble into? Sometimes you don't even mean to be all about it. You're just fixated on something. Didn't even turn on the TV to do that, to watch that. Find yourself amazed. Didn't even go down the street to go there and do this, but find yourself amazed. Didn't even leave his side, but find yourself amazed. So then, John is amazed. Look what the answer of the reply is from the angel. Number three. What is the mystery of the woman and the beast spoken of in Revelation chapter 17, verse 7? Well, here's what the Bible says. But the angel said unto me, why did you marvel? <laughs> why did you marvel? Listen, I will tell you the what, everybody? Mystery of the, and of the, that does what? Carries her, which has what? Seven heads and ten horns. The mystery is the explanation is the word you want to put there. The mystery is the explanation to all that John has just seen about the woman and the beast. Yeah, you, you, it looks nice, John, but let me explain a few things to you. Additionally, you must understand that they are explained together because the two at this point are inseparable. 
in terms of purpose because the woman derives her authority and power from the beast. The woman derives her authority and power from the beast. Up until this point in the passages, John has, has only been shown or really only seen a description of the woman. The beast is there, but he doesn't get a full description of it or a full explanation about it. So for him, he's looking and he just sees something that's amazing. Now, friends of mine, what you'll find in the latter half of, of this is that the explanation almost exclusively covers the beast. Is that meaning that the angel is contradicting himself by saying that I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast? No, it just adds further evidence that from this point on, as far as the angel is concerned, the woman and the beast are the same. But they have different functions. But they've got the same purpose. Not contradicting one another. Not co rather contradicting what he's saying, but rather making it very plain and clear. Are you understanding? Let's look at the beast, everybody. <clears throat> First, the idea of the past, present, and future of the reign of the beast is stated at least three times in verses 8 through 11. The idea, the idea of the past, present, and future of the reign of the beast is stated at least, how many times, everybody? Three times. Three times. Can I keep moving? All right, Revelation chapter 17, verse 8 through 11. Remember, I always put these things here for us so that we can look at them together. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Verse 10, there is also how many kings, everybody? Seven kings. Five have what? Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short while. Verse 11, the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going where? To perdition. Now watch this. This can be very tricky. Because all the was, is not, and is can come. Yeah. Come on, man. Y'all can smile at me. I know, I know it is, man. I, I studied this for most of my life, and I got to read it still four, five, six times over just to get it straight in my own head. All right? So watch this. The description of the beast is also a link to the title of God. Remember, God in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, is called the one who was, who is, and who is coming. <laughs> yeah. This particular title for God points to his activities all throughout history and pointing specifically to his movements in the end of time. Just as this linked God to the end of time, this title for the beast links him the same way looks at his activities in the totality of time while at the same time pointing to his movements at the end of time, all right? So, firstly, the idea of the past, present, and future of the beast. Secondly, this beast has a few parallels with the beast from the sea found in Revelation 13. Remember, if we're going to understand this, then we've got to understand the beast, amen? So let's look at some of the parallels. Are you with me? Let's look at some of the parallels. First, both reveal a kingdom. Both re reveal a kingdom who dwell on the earth will that, that those who dwell on the earth will wander after. 
Both reveal a kingdom that those who dwell on the earth will wonder after. Now, remember what we said. Those who dwell on the earth always point to whom, everybody? Anybody remember? When, when Revelation says those who dwell on the earth, who are they referring to? Say it, say it, someone, come on. Yeah, th those who are not serving God. Whenever Revelation makes reference to those who dwell on the earth, he's not talking about the righteous. <laughs> talking about the unrighteous. That's why here both reveal a kingdom that those who dwell on the earth will wander after. Can I move to the next one? Both powers are worshipped by those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Both powers are worshipped by those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Can I move to the next one? Just want to make sure. <laughs> Both are revealed to be a religio-political power. Both are revealed to be a religio-political power. Don't worry, we'll explain that. Can I keep moving? Both have names full of blasphemy. Both have names full of blasphemy. Remember now, we're saying that this beast parallels the beast of Revelation 13. We're showing their similarities, okay? We're showing their similarities. Can I go to the next one? Both persecute and make war with the saints. Both persecute and make war with the saints. And then the last one, both have wealth and economic control. Both have wealth and economic control. I see us writing. Can I, can I keep going? The major difference between the two powers is the mention of the unfaithful woman. She's not mentioned in Revelation 13. However, although not specifically identified, this unfaithful woman is explicitly implied during the warning of the second angel in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, where Babylon is called she. Babylon is called she. In Revelation chapter 17, the name of this woman is Babylon, the mother of harlots. There's a reason why, but friends of mine, that the two entities seemingly are shown separate. There's a reason why the two entities are shown separate. Are you ready? Firstly, to show the beast and the woman represent separately a political power and a religious power. Separately, the beast represents a political power. The woman represents a religious power and they are now united. Can I keep moving? Secondly, to reveal a period of time when the woman and the beast would be separate. Period of time when the woman and the beast would be separate. Now, if you've paid attention during our journey, we've made our case for that very clear. But we're going to come back to that, okay? But two reasons why the woman and the beast are seemingly separate is because to show that one represents a religious power, the other represents a political power, they are now united. And secondly, to show that there is a period of time when the woman and the beast would be, what everybody? Separate. Can I move to the next one? D, how does the seven heads help us understand the activities of the, of the beast? How does the seven heads? Firstly, we have to understand that there is dual symbolism going on here. Dual symbolism. Remember what the Bible says, 
Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, here is the mind which has what, everybody? Wisdom. So clearly, it takes a certain level of understanding to get what is about to be said. Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? Mountains on which the woman sits. Now, friends of mine, friends of mine, please. The woman is identified as being a what have we learned so far? Apostate church. The woman is identified as being an apostate church that according to the Bible sits on seven mountains or seven hills. Rome is known historically as the city on seven hills. And the headquarters of the papal church is located in the Vatican, which is built in... Built in Rome. See, friends of mine, here already, the angel is identifying to those who have wisdom who the beast is. All right, but you're saying, well, Hendrickson, that's a stretch. I got you. Okay. Let's look at the secondary application. The secondary application works through the understanding of the kingdoms that have already come. Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. There are also seven what, everybody? Five have what? And one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must what? A how long? Short time. All right. We have a better understanding of the five who have fallen based on the description of this beast found in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. I don't have time to go back over that, but you can read it. I'm just going to give you the kingdoms. Here are the five kingdoms based on the beast, because the beast of 13 and the beast of 12, we've already established, are what, everybody? One and the same. All right? So here are the kingdoms. The first one is what? The first one is what? The second one is what? The third one is? The fourth one is? pagan Rome, and the fifth one is papal Rome. Now watch this. This is the five that are fallen. They've come and gone. Amen? Five have come and they've fallen according to the Bible. So let's move to the one that is not. Excuse me, the one that is. Sorry. See, even me, I get myself confused. Yeah. The six head and I'm going to show this to you. The sixth head that is, I've got is not, but it is the sixth head that is. The head that is represents a period of time when the church and state are not united. Yeah, scribble out, scribble out not. The church and state are not united. Well, this makes sense. This makes sense, everybody, considering what we have learned. After the fifth head is wounded, it's wounded in when, everybody? 1798. Now, after the fifth head is wounded in 1798, what we have learned is that the power of the church is taken away. At that point, the power of the church over the state is taken away. Christianity is no longer the dominant motif in the world, and that gives way to the rise of secularism and atheism as the dominant controlling motifs in the world. During this time period, there is a clear separation between church and state. There's a clear separation between church and state, effectively ending or wounding the reign of the woman for a time. The political power continues to roll on. And we've learned already, please, please, we've learned already that while it may seem that the, the apostate Christianity and secularism and atheism are running in different directions, they're actually running the same track and they're going to eventually meet up. Throughout the first five kingdoms, church and state have been united. Throughout the first five kingdoms, church and state have been united as attempts to legislate worship throughout each age have been tried and failed, with the resulting failure always leading to the bloodshed of many. During the era of the sixth kingdom, or the sixth head, the mandate will be for those two important arms of life of people to be separate from one another. To be separate from one, one another, not only to prevent the mistakes, but also to ensure that they eventually come back together. Now, my friends, we've already studied in the previous lesson in Revelation chapter 13 about a power that would rise from the earth. And in our study, we learn that this power will be built on this principle of a separation. 
between church and state. The separation of church and state is like a death blow to the woman riding the beast. Therefore, during this time, the beast's political power is not with the woman in any shape or form or fashion. Not with her. The sixth head, beloved brothers and sisters, represents the United States. And Revelation 13 lets us know that although this power starts out believing in separation of church and state, they will eventually support the woman as they will someday begin to speak like a dragon. Eventually they will. So you're saying, well, Hendrickson, if eventually they will, then, then what, is this, what does this seven head represent? The yet to come. Can I help you right there? Here it is. Can I move forward? This is the final phase of the power of the woman supported by the beast. Final phase. You know how Revelation 13 describes it? With the restrictions of church and state torn down, America will make an image of the beast. And the papal church is given new life and once again will be the top major power in the world. Once again, having sway and influence over the world. Why? Because they have the backing of the United States. It is here in this moment where papal Rome arises from the bottomless pit spoken of in verse 8. And for this period of time, with America as her backer, she causes the world to wander after her. Secularism and atheism and apostate religions from around the world now sit at the same table drinking the wine, the false doctrines of the papal church, and they are all memorized, they are all mesmerized, drunk by the words that proceed out of the mouth of the papal church. And as a result, listen to me, as a result, the world wonders after her in amazement. Listen, in their inebriated state, they give her what she wants and she comes and she gets pushed to the head of the table. Now, friends, here is where I want to stretch your mind a little bit if I haven't already stretched it. America alone cannot do that. America alone cannot do that. What America can do is be her backer. Because America is the single most influential country in the world today. Amen? However, America, in the way she is, is really just a doorway to a larger place. America is the way that she gets in the door. The real place where this unfaithful woman does her damage on the world stage will be seen at the table of the United Nations. How can we say this, you say? Well, I'm glad you asked. What other world organization has so many world leaders sitting at the table? What other world organization uh, has so much influence over the world and the affairs of the world? What other world organization has the power to make policies and decisions that the world must adhere to? And who carries the biggest stick in the UN. The United States. So it would only make sense, Elder Kevin, then, that this unfaithful woman, this apostate church, would need the backing of the most powerful, influential political power of the day. With America backing papal Rome, they push papal Rome to the forefront of the UN and the UN bows down to the suggestions of the woman. Let us sink in for a minute. Because in the, in the scheme of this prophecy, it makes sense. Is there, really any, is there really an eighth head? Is there really an eighth head? Revelation 17, verse, eight, verse 11, the beast that was and is not is himself also what? The eighth and is of the what? And is going to where? 
What does the eighth head represent? The eighth head represents the perfected worldwide union of church and state. Therefore, it isn't an eighth head as much as it is the completion of everything. Everything together. Finally, finally the cylinders are all kicking. And finally we're all rowing the boat in the same direction. And atheism and secularism and the apostate Christianity have now all come full circle. Now, we've dealt with the heads. But there's still one thing left. There are 10 horns. There are 10 horns, amen? Again, if I've stretched your mind so far, be prepared for me to stretch it just a little bit further, unapologetically. What do the 10 horns represent? Well, here's what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. The 10 horns which you saw are what, everybody? 10, king, ten kings who have received what? No kingdom as yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. They are of, and they will give their, and to whom everybody? The beast. Now watch this. Let's see what we learned so far. Just based on that pastor of scripture. Can we do that? Firstly, they are a kingdom singular. They are a kingdom singular implying that they are of one universal power. They are a kingdom, singular, implying that they are of one universal power. Are you hearing me? Secondly, they have not yet established their kingdom against singular, implying that the lines are there. It just, not, it just has not been acted upon yet. Are you hearing me so far? Can I keep moving? Can I keep moving? Number three, they rule the world for a short time, which makes sense considering that prophetically we are kind of letting, or we are told that the world will not be under one dominant rulership ever again. But for this short time, they come together. They have one purpose meaning that they are in agreement to establish this universal power. And number five, they give their power to whom, everybody? To the beast. Now, based off of these, based off of, off of these uh, 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 insights, here's what we can conclude. There will be an establishment of a universal power that will rule the entire world for a short time. They will divide the world into 10 divisions and they will rule the world through these 10 divisions and do so with the beast. So friends, if that's what the Bible says, the question that has to be asked is, could this really happen today? Could it really happen today? Well, watch this. In a report put out by the UN in 2009, entitled, you can look it up, the Millennium, De the Millennium Development, De Development Goals Report, they have already sub subtly divided the world into 10 regions. Now, what's amazing about this is that they've done it subtly and seemingly innocently. But the world is divided into 10 regions already. Unless you think that, oh, Hendrickson, you're just spewing conspiracy. Th this is their document, not mine. <laughs> just go Google it. <laughs> you can read it. And they innocently begin to show you statistics and things from the 10 regions of the world that they have divided the world into. What are the 10 regions? Well, you have the developed regions. That's North America. You have the countries of the Commonwealth of the Independent States. That's Eastern Europe. Then you have Northern Africa, Sub-Sahara Africa, Southeastern Asia, Oceania, Eastern Asia, Southern Asia, Western Asia, and then finally Latin America and the Caribbean. 
My friends, they have, the world is already divided into ten under an organization that claims to aspire to universal or world peace. See, while some people were concerned about the fact that the leader of the papal church spoke in Congress, I was just as interested about the fact that the leader of the papal church spoke at the UN. Not sitting there and and not speaking there as the leader of Vatican City, because of course Vatican City is is, is, uh, recognized as a country in and of itself. No. Not there as the leader of Vatican City, there as the leader of the papal church. He is there in a religious capacity. There as a religious, in a religious capacity. He's there at the seat of the, sitting at a, at a table rather, that claims to have the best interests of the world at heart. And these people have already divided the world into 10 regions, which is just so eerily familiar to the idea that this beast has 10 horns. Now, follow me here. I've already told you that America will be the vehicle by which the papal church returns to prominence. But I have also said that America is not the end game. Why? Because America by itself cannot, cannot lead to world domination. Just can't. However, the UN is the best place for that agenda to be pushed. And who else but the U.S. could introduce a player to the UN and cause the UN or the whole world to worship its image? With the backing of America, America on her side, she is given influence on an international level, the likes of which she has not seen since 1798. So we have to switch our focus from simply looking at America and start looking at and paying attention to some of the things that the UN is saying and those who make make up its core body. And beloved, once you understand what they do and how they govern and run the world, to me, Elder Doug, it's not a far leap of conceivability to believe that the UN, who is already seen as the world's watchdog, would have a plan in place that would divide the world into 10 regions and that there would be leaders in each region that would sit around a table and fill up guidelines and make rules and regulations that the world would have to adhere to. And who better to lead the charge? Who better to be at the head of the table than the undisputed moral and religious authority in the world? The papal church and its head. See, my friends, there are lines of things that are being put in place right now to fulfill the prophecies that are in this book that are being pushed before our very eyes in a seemingly innocent manner. My friends, this isn't conspiracy theory. This isn't fantasy This is what is going on in our world today. Satan is getting his house in order. Listen to me. Satan is getting his house in order to make a final push against the people of God. And my friends, it's high time that we got our own houses in order. And make a final push against Satan in our lives. It's number six, and we'll 
close here because I think I, when I was writing, I said, I think I've given you enough to think about. <laughs> given you enough to think about today. What's the main message of Revelation 17? Through all the imagery, what can't be lost, what can't be lost is that Revelation 17 is about explaining why. Yeah, God has judged the way he has. All that we have learned about adds to the case for God's judgments and makes it clear that this was the right way to do things. All that we have learned, everything we've heard of, is making the case for God's judgments. Now, my friends, I I won't begin to... uh, believe that everything that we have learned tonight has settled easy with everybody. It's a little difficult. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to understand. And even if it's not difficult to understand, Brother Percy, it's difficult to accept. Because who really wants to accept the notion and the idea that the world around you is being manipulated and set up for something to happen in the end. But I read somewhere that the closer we draw to the end of this world, there will be men of influence in the world who will be under satanic influence and won't even recognize it. Can you understand now why why, why Satan, although he, he looks and sees the apostate church go down in flames in 1798, he turns right around and has another plan. Because he recognizes that to get my goal, sometimes I got to cut my nose to spy my face. And he's willing to make that sacrifice. He'll sacrifice whatever's necessary in order to make his goal, to reach his goals. He'll sacrifice whatever's necessary in order to achieve his ends. He'll sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to get his job done. The question I have for you today is what are you willing to sacrifice? You're in this room, you're you're sitting at home, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing willing to let go of? What are you willing to to depart from for a time and a season so that the end goal of eternity with Jesus can be achieved? What are you willing to, to say goodbye to so that you can have your place in eternity assured? My friends, the old song says, I, I, I would rather have Jesus than anything this world affords me today. My friends, don't be seduced by the economic wealth of this world. Don't be seduced by the social status of this world. Don't be seduced by the comforts of this world. And realize that that if you and I have to struggle for a little bit down here, I got a home up in that kingdom. Oh, yes. Got a home up in that kingdom. I would rather, Elder Kevin, struggle down here for a time and a season and live for all eternity up there than to live in the comforts and the lavishness. The psalmist puts it this way, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. My friends, you've clearly seen the the setup, the inevitability of what the enemy is going to do. My question to you is now that you know, what are you going to do? What choice are you going to make? What decisions are are you, do you have to uh, act upon now? And so I'll make it easy for you, as I've made it easy for you all week. You've got two choices. You've got a heaven to gain 
and a hell to shun. That's it. The world didn't give you heaven, didn't make heaven, didn't die for you to have heaven. So the world can't give it. The world can't take it away. And while you may be concerned about the comforts of this world, I want you to know that it's better, man, it is better to be in the discomfort of this world and be in the comfort of Jesus than it is to be in anything else. So my friends, as we close and we, uh, we pray, every head is bowed and every eye is closed, whether you're here or whether you're home, you've got a choice to make. Listen to me, if you're home, you've got a choice to make. It's this simple. If you're in this room, you've got a choice to make. The choice is yours. Are you going to choose Jesus? Or are you going to keep on living your life any old way you want to? It's been presented to you. The gospel is clear. And the reason why Jesus is this uh, explicit in his explanation is that he does not want anyone to be fooled. So if you're home, if you're in this room, you've got a choice to make. Heads are bowed, the eyes are closed, the folks are praying. You've got a choice to make. And you can make it very simply tonight. You can make it very simply today just by saying, yes, Jesus. Yes. This isn't for you if, you, if you've been baptized and you, you've already been running this race. You, you, you take this as a moment of reconsecration between you and God. There's some people here under the sound of my voice in this room at home who know they need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. How long halt ye between two opinions? How much more do you need to see the devastation that will inevitably come by not saying yes to Jesus Christ? Don't be one of those that the Bible declares God gives over to a reprobate mind because you sat here through this entire journey day after day, week after week, and said, this is good stuff, elder, but did not make a decision for him. You're home. You want to make that decision. 441-234-2979. You're in this room. You want to make that decision. You're saying, Hendrickson, I need to say yes to Jesus all the way through baptism. Come on, just put your hand up wherever you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Is there anybody else? Yes, Hendrickson, I, I, I've listened to you. And it's not you, but it's the gospel that you presented. It's compelling. I realize it burns in my heart. It's truth. And you want to say yes. Yes, I need to be baptized. 441-234-2979. Call us. We'll work with you. We want to connect with you so that we can touch you and help you along your journey. You're in this room. We've already had some who've raised their hand. Is there anyone else? Maybe you're, you're saying, Hendrickson, I, I don't know if I'm ready for baptism. I'm, I'm not sure this is a lot to take in. Please, beloved, don't put off to tomorrow what God is calling you to today. The Bible records a story where the Ethiopian eunuch was, was told the mysteries of all things. And it was declared, there is water. What hindereth thou? Hendrickson, I don't, ever, I don't know everything about this church yet, but you know enough to have come each and every meeting to this series. Don't delay. Make the decision. 441-234-2979 so that we can help you along this journey as we have journeyed through Revelation. Come on, let's pray. Our God and our Father, God, it's decision day. It's been decision week. We've made calls and, and, and we've appealed. And folks have prayed God. And lives have been transformed. Hearts and minds have been changed. Minds made up. Not going back. God, for those who are still in the valley, in this room, at home, still struggling, not knowing if they should make the phone call, not knowing if they should raise their hand, God, I, I pray that you'll work with them. That you'll wrestle with them, God that you'll speak with them, that they'll hear the voice of Jesus saying, come home, come home. 
God, that that person may be watching us, God, that they'll make that phone call, 441-234-2979, so that we can work with them, God. Oh, Lord, what profit of the man to gain the world and lose their soul? That's not our desire for anybody. And so, God, we pray for every heart and mind the decisions will be solidified. Then for those, Lord, who have already made up, strengthen them, empower them, encourage them, and most do what you have called us to do, proclaim this great message. Now, God, as we close, I ask for the same three things that I've asked for this entire series. Number one, God, that you'll keep us hoping in you. Number two, God, that we'll, you'll keep us hungry for you. Number three, God, that you'll keep us humble before you. God, this is our prayer. This is our plea. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Let all of God's people say amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together. Bless God. Come on, put your hands together. We had some folks make a decision tonight, and we praise God for that. I want to speak to those folks who are at home right now. Listen, God bless you. Thank you for spending this time with us. We know that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in your heart, in your life, in your very room right now. And so this is what I want you to do. Maybe you feel compelled uh, to listen and you could feel compelled to want to know more. And maybe this might be the first time you've heard this message just like this. You can go back and listen to this message and other in these series at SomersetSDHChurch.org. All of the information is there. You can click and look at some previous messages in this series. Our worksheets are there as PDFs. You can download those. Or you can contact us, 441-234-2979. If someone's not here, leave a message. Or you say, Preacher, I got to talk to you. Give me a call, 441-595-1105. We want to connect with you. We want to grow with you. There are two beautiful faith communities in this western area of the island of Bermuda, Rockaway, One Rec Road, and Somerset, Six Beacon Hill Road. We would love to see your face in the place if you are living in the island of Bermuda. If you're not and you are international, we would still love to work with you, man. So again, give us a call. The numbers are 441-234-2979 or me personally, 441-595-1105. You got a prayer request. She wants to pray for you. Prayer at SomersetSDHChurch.org. Or you want to, again, just send me an email. Pastor at SomersetSDHChurch.org. Whatever way you do it, just know that we are trying to make it as easy as possible because we want to connect with you. We love you, and we hope that we'll see you one day in either one of our churches, Rockaway or Somerset, real soon. God bless you. Come on, put our hands together for our folk who are at home. God bless you. Thank you. To you all that are here, have you had a good time? Have you had a good time? Amen. Listen, we want to recognize the presence of our... our